Hello and welcome to this lesson on least squares regression. So we have looked at the idea of projections in two-dimensional and n-dimensional space. And one of the interesting things about linear algebra is that we, although we've been visualizing in two or three dimensions, the challenge in making visual sense is that we quickly jump to working in hundreds of dimensions. And this is going to be a case where where that happens. So even though a linear regression problem is 2D in the strict sense, meaning that if I have this set of data down here and I want to fit a line to correspond to the X and Y, uh, then I, I can see this in two dimensions, but to do this using linear algebra, we're going to be working with three-dimensional vectors, uh, one specifically to represent the Y values. So let's make our problem from last time more visualizable in 3D. We're going to look at just three ordered pairs in two dimensions. And so what we want to do is we want to write an equation. Our goal is to get some, some linear function of the form, say, y equals mx plus b. And so we know that this is m is the slope, b is the vertical intercept, and we want to make this a little bit more linear algebra based. So what we're searching for is we need to find the, the best slope and the best y-intercept. I'm going to rewrite this problem a little bit. I'm going to rewrite this as y equals, instead of m, I'm going to use beta 1 times x, plus for b, I'm going to use beta sub 0. So you'll typically use betas in uh, general regression analysis. Now, ideally, if these points all fell along the same line, then the linear function would be just a matter of computing the slope and the vertical intercept. However, I see that from x equals 1 to x equals 2, my y value jumps by 11, but then the y value only jumps by 6 from 2 to 3, and so this is not a perfect linear function. Uh, so keep that in mind for a moment. Now one of the things that we want to observe is that if I write this equation for all three of these, if I write y equals m times the first x, which is 1, plus the b value, that should add up to the y value of 11, right? So I'm looking for a slope and intercept that when I plug in 1 for x, I'll get 11 for y. Similarly, if uh, to get 22 for y, that means I'm going to plug in a 2 for x and multiply by my slope and add my vertical intercept. And same thing here, 28 equals m times 3 plus b. And I, I guess uh, to be to be consistent, we're, we're saying we're calling this beta 1 and beta naught. So if we call this beta 1 and beta 1 and beta 1, and then beta naught, beta naught, beta naught then I'm going to go ahead and first of all look at this as this is beta naught times 1 over here. And the reason I'm going to do that is because I am going to form a system of equations out of this. And so I will do one more thing here. I'm just going to go ahead and in interchange these terms. I'm going to write beta naught first and then beta 1. And I'll see if you agree with me here, but this is 11, 22, 28 multiplied by, if I have beta naught and beta 1 as a vector, then my coefficient matrix here will be uh, 1, 1, 1. So I'm writing the beta naught terms first. I'm switching these two columns. And then 1, 2, and 3 here. And if you multiply this out, you see that we have the exact same thing. So these are my y values. I can call this vector y. And I'm going to call this matrix X, because that's a matrix, and I'm going to call this the beta hat vector. And beta with a hat over it indicates that that's the vector that contains the unknowns that I'm solving for. Now one of the immediate things is, okay, we could technically solve this. Now X is not square, so X doesn't have an inverse. We can't solve it that way. We know that y is not equal, uh, not going to be equal to X beta, because look what happens if I try to solve this system 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, 3, and then 11, 22, 28 for my constants. 
if I perform Gaussian elimination on this to solve for what are my beta naught and beta one, then I'll get something that looks like this. I will get zero, zero, one, zero, one, zero, and zero, and excuse me, one, zero, zero. So what this tells me is that beta naught equals zero. That's the first row. The second one tells me that beta one equals zero. No problem so far, but the second or the third row tells me that zero equals one, and we know that that means that there is no solution. And that makes sense because there is no one slope and one vertical intercept that will satisfy all of these equations. So there is no beta naught and beta one such that we can generate this equation here, that we can, that we can satisfy this equation. That is, the system is inconsistent. Intuitively, these points are not along a straight line, and therefore I cannot solve for the slope. I mean, I can find the best fitting slope and the best fitting vertical intercept, but I can't find the, there is no the vertical intercept and slope that will go through all three of these points. Well, that all is lost, right? Because we know we can find the best fitting line. We've done this in the past before. So let's think about, let's think about X, that matrix, which by the way, that X matrix is called the design matrix, design matrix. It's just what it's called in statistics. This is a statistical problem. And that matrix X consists of two columns, X1, that's the column vector of ones, and X2, which is the column vector of the one, the two, and the three, the X values. So if we plot these two vectors here, one, 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 and one, two, three, notice that they're three dimensional. And the reason they're three dimensional is because we have three ordered pairs. If we had a hundred ordered pairs, this would be a 100 dimensional problem. Okay, so what we're gonna try to do is we're gonna try to see, can we find a beta naught and beta one that best estimates or that best, that reduces the total amount of error? Now the error is the distance between the point and the, the actual line, right? The point is the exact Y value, whatever that Y value is right there, maybe around 11 uh, or uh, yeah, uh, 111. And the line predicts an output of 12, but here uh, the, the error is a little bit greater we see, and here we have another error, which is the distance between the point and the line. So that is, if we plug our uh, three into our equation that we get, we're gonna get a point on the line, which is gonna be slightly higher than the actual Y value of the point, which is 28. So these are all errors, but the goal is to minimize, minimize the errors. Okay, and specifically, the way we're going to do that is we're going to minimize the sum of the squared errors. That's why we call it least squares. Okay, so we plotted these two vectors. Now what do we do with that? Next, we know that any linear combinations of these vectors can create any new vector along the plane formed by them. So as a new definition, we'll work with this in the next lesson, the column space of X is the span of the columns of X. That is, where can we get to with these two vectors. Well, I can travel, I know that I can put these together tip to tail, and I can get anywhere along this plane by taking the right linear combination of the 1, 1, 1, and the 1, 2, 3 vectors. So the span of these is the plane below. You might see this written as any multiple of the 1, 1, 1 vector plus any multiple of the 1, 2, 3 vector. That's usually how you write the actual span in terms of Okay, any multiple of this to put tip to tail to any multiple of the second vector. All right, so there we have it. So that's the, the span of those two things. Next, we look to see that y, our y vector that contains our responses, our y values, is not a linear combination of the, of the columns of x. That is, there is no beta that will provide coefficients to make y be a linear combination of the columns of X. That is Y is not in the column space of X. It is close though. So here we have, notice 11, 22, 28. That's our data vector. That's our, those are our Y values. Notice that there's a gap between that vector and the plane. So we can generate with our two 
column vectors, we can generate any vector in this plane, but we cannot generate this new, this, this y vector here. This is our actual y vector. And that's exactly why we came up with no solution to this system, because that vector is simply not a linear combination of the 1, 1, 1 and the 1, 2, 3 vectors. Our next task is to find the best beta vector that we will call beta hat. Okay, beta hat is just going to be the best estimate of the slope and intercept such that we get y hat, a vector of y values that are as close to the actual y vector as possible. So y hat will hopefully be close to y. That is its values that they, these two vectors will point in close to the same direction. But now we know that the y hat vector can only lie inside of the plane because with the two column vectors 1, 1, 1 and 1, 2, 3, we can only generate vectors on that plane. So one thing that we can look at is, for example, this vector right here, which is inside of that plane, we see that the distance between, this is the actual y vector here, this is just a sample y hat vector, we see that the distance between them is they're 8.34 units apart, right? So I could say that the components inside of this vector here, which would be you know three components, uh, predict the values in this vector here, but there's an error of 8.34 units. That's the distance between them. That's how far off we are. So I can continue, and that's if uh, beta naught is 0 0.1 and beta 1 is 7.8. So what we're saying here is that if we take 0 0.1 times the 1, 1, 1 vector plus 7.8 times the 1, 2, 3 vector, that's going to give us these three components here. And this is our y hat vector. That's our estimate of the y values for the two, the three inputs, x is 1, x is 2, x is 3. Um, the actual y vector is this guy here, 11, 22, 28. And the distance between these two vectors, that is my y vector minus my y hat vector, the length of that, the distance, that's the red, that's the red portion in that graph, that is equal to 8.34 units. Okay, so you can see that these are not the same. I'm predicting for an x of 1 a y value of 7.9, but the real y value is 11. Uh, I'm predicting a y value of 15.7 for x of 2, but the real y value is 22. And so you can see that we could probably get a little bit closer. So let's think about how we would do this. Well, if we tweaked beta naught to be 4.5 and beta 1 to be 7.7, .7, now that generates a vector that's closer to the tip of our actual y vector. And we see that the error is smaller. It's only 2.45 now, which means that those values in the y hat vector are a lot closer to the y vector. And with 3.3 for beta naught and 8.5 for beta 1. This is just a different angle. This is our y vector, which is not inside the plane, our y hat vector, which is inside the plane. And you can see that our error is now only 2.04, so the distance between them is a lot smaller. But also one thing to take into account here is look at this angle right here. The shortest distance between any two points um, is, is a line and specifically a line that is perpendicular to the plane along which the other line lies, that's gonna be the shortest distance between those two points. So what we want is we want y hat, we want y hat to be a projection of y onto the plane formed by the span of our two vectors. So that surface is, is characterized by the space, uh, which we'll just call, we'll refer to that as x. So the projection of, I'm sorry, this should be the other way around. We're projecting y 
y ha uh, the y vector onto our uh, span of x. And we already know kind of how to do that. So, but from right triangle geometry, we can prove that the shortest possible length of a side will occur when the two sides project down upon one another, forming a new side with a right angle. We can even see in a computer program that the error above is optimal, about 2.04, the distance between our y hat and the exact y. So this is the actual regression equation. In Desmos, we could type in y, we could create a table of our data points, type in in a separate box y sub 1 and then the tilde, which is uh, I think shift and the, the button to the left of 1 on your keyboard, b, not, b sub 0 plus b sub 1 times x, it gives us those estimates. And you can see that this r squared, the closer that is to 1 or 100%, that's, this is about a 97.2% fit. So how do we find this beta hat vector mathematically? I mean, we can keep changing the values of beta naught and beta 1, seeing the distance between our two values. But here's the thing. We know that we want the estimate of beta hat to be such that y hat is orthogonal to y minus x beta. So let's think about this for a second. Here we have inside of that plane, we have our vector, right? Which is this vector is going to be the beta naught times um, our x1 vector plus beta 1 times our x2 vector. So that's the span that's inside of the plane. x1 and x2 are the two columns of the x matrix that forms this plane here. And then we want to project this down right here. This is our error that we, we, we were talking about. Oops, close enough. This is our error. There we go, and we know we want that angle to be orthogonal. So this right here, we've just written as, as the x matrix times the beta hat vector, which consists of the beta naught and beta 1. So that is actually equal to that product there. This vector here is our y vector. And so if x, if we just for a moment think about this red thing as the error, then we know that x beta hat, this vector here, the green one, x beta hat plus the red vector, the or the error vector, I'll just call that error, we know that when we add those two together, we're going to get exactly y. And so that means the error vector is going to be y minus x beta, or x beta hat. So this vector here is y minus x beta hat. Well, we're getting closer because now we also know that if two things are perpendicular to one another, their dot product is going to be 0. So we're going to use that tool next to help us solve for beta. This implies that every vector in the plane formed by the columns of x must be orthogonal to y minus x beta hat, and so it follows the equation um, x transpose, which this just contains the columns of x laid on their side. Every one of those dotted with this red vector here must equal 0. And that's all we really need at this point, because now we can solve for beta hat in terms of the knowns. So if this is true, this implies that if I distribute x transpose y minus x beta hat, that's going to equal 0. And now I want to solve for beta hat, so let me uh, add, uh, add x beta to both sides, x beta hat, and that's going to equal x transpose uh, times the y vector. Now, assuming that x is... Ah, you know what? This should be a, an x transpose here. I didn't distribute that through all the way. So um, x is not necessarily a square matrix, as we saw above. It just depends on how much data you have and how many things you're trying to estimate. But if you multiply a matrix, let's say x is m by n, and you multiply it by its transpose, that's going to be n by m, 
And when you multiply these two together, you're going to get an n by n matrix. So that means that this component here, x transpose x, is square. And if it is invertible, it, it may not be invertible, but we, if it is invertible, we can multiply both sides by the inverse of that. And so beta hat is equal to the, the inverse of x transpose x multiplied by x transpose y. And this is, again, I'll just make a star up here and say, assuming x transpose x has an inverse. It may not always, but it usually does for uh, many types of real world data. So we're not going to worry about what happens when it's not invertible. There are other things you can do. But now we've been able to estimate beta hat in terms of those other parameters. So for our data set where we had, for our earlier data set, this is a different example down here, for our data set, recall that we had y, which was 11, 22, 28, that was our y vector, is equal to x beta. So here were the columns of x, our x1 and our x2, and multiplied by our the things that we wanted to estimate, our beta hat vector, we can now solve for it. All we really, all we need to know is what is inside of x and what is inside of y. So our beta hat for this data set will be x transpose, which is 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, 3, times x, which is 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, 3. And we want the inverse of that multiplied by the transpose of x multiplied by the y vector, which is 11, 22, 28. And that will give us the beta hat vector. So let's go ahead and do that in a calculator. You can do that in your graphing calculator. You can use a piece of technology on the web to multiply matrices. But guess what we're going to get? Beta hat is going to equal 3.33 and 8.5. And that's our estimate of the intercept. Remember, this is the intercept, or the, the y-intercept, I guess. Uh, and this is the slope. So our line of best fit, best fit is the line y equals mx plus b, so 8.5x plus 3.33. That's our line of best fit. So now if we were to plot the data and the line of best fit, well, look at that. We got the same values. That's the line of best fit, minimal error, and 3.33 and 8.5 are also about what we had for what we were able to get as the smallest error. That's pretty cool. That's pretty good stuff. And just so that we have that interactive sense, I've also linked the, this applet in our in our notes here. And here's again that vector 11, 22, 28. You kind of just see what's going on when I change the value of beta naught. So beta naught just, remember that's gonna, we're gonna take a linear combination of the 1, 1, 1 and 1, 2, 3 vectors, which span this entire plane. And as we change those values, we're just generating another vector that's inside of that plane. And you see that if we make beta naught close to zero, that is a zero slope, with just a y-intercept of 8.9, that would be a, a horizontal line. Uh, that would clearly not model our three y values, 11, 22, and 28, very well. So you can see we have a huge amount of error, but we can make that error pretty small. And if we just get the right combination of beta 1 and beta naught. So I think 8.5 and 8.5 and about... 3.33 were the optimal values. And you can see that we're getting pretty close to that minimal error. And you can see that those, that that vector looks to be about perpendicular to that plane, or that, that amount of error right there is perpendicular. Whereas down here, you can see that that is gonna make a really long distance. The shortest distance will be directly to the plane. 
Awesome. So now we're ready to go ahead and do some to do some whoops, do some modeling and actually build some of these models. These are really quite fun to build because all we need to do is just get things into this form and decide what we're going to, what kind of equation we're going to try to write. So an example one, a study compared the speed x in miles per hour and the average fuel economy y in miles per gallon for cars. The results are shown in the table. Find a quadratic model in standard form for the data. So here we see that if you drive a car at an average speed of about 15 miles per hour, your fuel economy will be about 22.3 miles per gallon. As you drive faster, you can see that uh, your, as your average speed goes up, if you were to draw, drive 30 miles on av 30 miles per hour on average on your uh, tank of gas, you're, you're getting about 29 miles per gallon. And then if you, uh, you know, drive up to 40, 40 miles per hour, your, your fuel efficiency increases. And this is a function of the details of cars that we don't need to go into here. But we want to come up with a model for this to say, okay, well, what would be the optimal speed? So a quadratic model in standard form will look like this. Y equals a x squared plus b x plus c. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to write all of these values to 22.3 is my y when x is 15. Uh, plus b is, I don't know what that uh, value is going to be, but I do know that when I plug in 15 for x, this equation should be satisfied. For the next one, 25.5, that is when x is 20, so 20 squared here, 20 here, plus c. And I'm going to repeat this for all of these values. And pretty soon you'll see what, how, the, how this patternizes out so you don't have to write these all out extensively. But for now, let's just go ahead and do it. And then 29.0 equals a times, oh, this should be 25 back here. So 25, and this will be 30 squared plus b times 30 plus c, and two more, 28.8 equals a times 35 squared plus b times 35 plus c. And you can already see we have way more equations than we do unknowns, so you're not going to be able to get an exact quadratic through all these points, unless they happen to fall along the perfect parabola. And then 30.0 equals a times 40 squared plus b times 40 plus c. And um, we're going to refer to a, we're going to call that beta, beta 2, beta 1, and beta naught. You, you can leave them as a, b, and c, but this is just really customary to use these. So if I write this out in, in matrix form, I'm going to see that my y vector is going to consist of all the values from 22.3 down to 30.0. I'm going to have an X matrix, and again, I'm just going to write my beta naught, beta 1, and beta 2 in reverse order. So I'm going to basically invert these three columns, put the C column to the left, the B column in the middle, the A column on the right. Now, all the coefficients of C, by the way, are 1s, right? So beta naught multiplied by 1, that's just going to produce all of these C values here. And so I'll have a bunch of 1s all the way down the line, dot, 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 one. The beta one column is 15, 20, 25, et cetera, down until we hit 40. And then this is going to be the A coefficients, or the beta two coefficients, which are 15 squared, 20 squared, all the way down to uh, 40 squared. And so once again, to estimate, so this is my y vector, my design matrix, my estimates of beta naught and beta one, beta two. And I know that again, to, to calculate those beta hats, the best estimate will be x transpose x inverse times x transpose times the y vector. So I have all of those. I'm gonna, I can go ahead and enter those into my calculator. And I will get approximately 
1.0 and negative, um, I maybe should round two decimal places. Uh, so let me just take this back. 10.17, uh, 1.02 and negative 0 0.01. And so now what I have is a best fitting quadratic model. So remember, this is beta naught, beta one, beta two. So my best fitting parabola will be y equals negative 0 0.01 x squared plus 1.02 x minus, uh, I'm sorry, plus 10.17. And there's my best fitting parabola. So let's go ahead and take a look at this data and do some analysis on what we have going on. Let's go ahead and jump to Desmos. So when I look at my data, uh, we were just told to plot a quadratic model to it, but we have reason to believe that this data is, is pretty, looks somewhat quadratic. And um, also I've rounded this, this A coefficient to three decimal places because when I plot it without, I, I don't get a, quite a very good looking parabola, but that extra decimal place makes all the difference. And so you see that now that we have this model, we could do some analysis, like we could say, well, this is a pretty good fit. So how many miles per hour would a car, uh, or how many miles per gallon would a car going 18 miles per hour get? Well, now I can predict that. I could say that a car going 18 miles per hour is getting a fuel economy of about 24 miles per gallon. And I can also see here that I could predict that the, uh, if you, drive at a rate of 39.23 or about 39 miles per hour, you're going to optimize for this particular car, your fuel economy, and you're going to get 30 miles per gallon. Now this is extrapolation beyond our data set, but it seems that if we drive uh, really fast, like 65 miles an hour, that uh, we're really kind of making our car become fairly fuel inefficient, like 55 miles an hour gets you about 27 miles per gallon. So that's exactly what we want to be able to do with data is model it and be able to answer questions about it and to be able to interpolate and say uh, what's going on for values in between our data points. So that's, uh, that's no different than another example. Let's say that here we're looking at the uh, I think this was back a couple of years ago now, but these are temperatures. These are the average highs and average lows in Chandler in the 85225 zip code based upon several years worth of data. And so if we look at these actual data points, let's say we want to model the average low temperature and we see that uh, this is months after January. So in January, the average low temp is 41. And and of course, the, the summer, the average low temp is, uh, you know, June. And then we could see that uh, in July, the temperatures get close to 80 degrees. When you're talking like four or five o'clock in the morning, you get a little bit of that, perhaps that cool period. Now we see that this is uh, pretty sinusoidal and we should see that every year this is kind of the same pattern. So first of all, we have to come up with a plan, and we're not going to describe how you come up with that plan, but we believe that this is going to be some cosine function. Uh, the period of a cosine function, just as a little refresher, if you have y equals uh, cosine of bx, the period is equal to 2 pi over that value. So because we want this period to be 12 months, um, to find, to make this a 12 month period, we would have to solve for the value of B. And what we would get is B is equal to pi over six. So that, that will make sure that the curve starts to repeat itself, goes from low back to low in a matter of 12 months. So that's where the pi over six comes from multiplied by the number of months, and then we're going to have some amplitude here, right? Because we don't want to have just an amplitude of one. Clearly this thing goes from 40 all the way up to about 78. And then we're also going to need to shift this thing up because this is the center line of your sine or cosine function. And we want that center line to be in the middle of that, which, you know, the average average low is somewhere probably in the 50s. So we, we don't want this thing to be shifted down and have a center line on the x-axis. So in any case, this is the model that we've decided. M represents the number of months after January and T represents the temperature 
in degrees Fahrenheit find least squares estimates for beta naught and beta one and interpret the meaning. Meaning, so we can do the same thing here. We can say for a temperature of 41 degrees, a 41 degree temperature would be the output if we took beta naught, added beta one times cosine of pi over six times uh, the month, which is zero. And all these equations would look the same all the way to the last value, which would be 40 equals beta naught plus beta one cosine of pi over six times the month number, which is 11. And so now we can see that this is gonna constitute our y vector. It's gonna be, so 41 all the way down to 40. It's gonna be our y vector. Our, uh, if we lift up the beta naught and beta one by matrix multiplication, then what we'll have in here is this will be a column of ones. And that's always gonna be true of our vertical intercept. And then this column, the beta one column, is gonna have all the cosines, cosine of pi over six times zero, um, cosine pi over six times one, all the way until we get down to cosine of pi over six times 11. So now this is gonna be our design matrix. This is our beta hat vector, and we are ready to do the computation. So let's do that in our calculator. And so estimating our beta hat as once again, same formula, x transpose x inverse times x transpose times the y vector. This is going to yield about 57.4 uh, and negative 17.7. So that means that my equation for this data set is going to be, be my beta naught, which is the 57.4. My beta one is gonna be negative 17.7, so plus beta one times cosine of pi over six. And I shouldn't use y and x, this is actually the temperature and the number of months. So there's my final equation. And now I can go ahead and look at this data in Desmos. So if we take a look at our temperatures, we can actually see that, um, probably need to do a little bit of zooming here. We would just wanna go from zero to 11. And we can see that sinusoidal nature of that data. And now if we overlay our function, now it's not perfect. Uh, it's a, it, maybe we wanted to actually shift that a little bit, but uh, this is the best fitting. These are th this beta naught and this beta one, the 57.4 and the negative 17.7 are the best values that you could have for this exact template model. Our template model being beta naught plus beta one cosine pi over six times m. Now the only reason this looks this way is because maybe this wasn't the best template choice. Maybe we would actually want to shift this a little bit to the, looks like if we shifted it a little bit to the right, uh, it would be a better fit. Um, but you know, it's, it's not bad. It, it does estimate our data. Here we're estimating in, let's see, this would be in May, uh, average low temperature is 61, but we're predicting right around 66 and a quarter which is about a five and a quarter degree difference. And the grand scheme of things, not a tremendous uh, deal breaker there. So it's a pretty reasonable model for what it is. Let's do one more. Uh, in this case, we have what's called a multivariate regression. We have a model that we want to find of the form y equals beta naught plus beta one w plus beta two d, where y represents a person's blood alcohol content, BAC, as a function of their weight W, which is in pounds, and the number of drinks consumed, D. So based on uh, your weight and how many drinks you've consumed, we can predict your blood alcohol concentration. Use weights between 100 and 140 pounds and between one and four drinks. And um, below is a table that makes this data a bit more clear. So for example, a person that has one drink and weighs 100 pounds should have, uh, on average, a blood alcohol content of 0 0.032. Uh, I think 0 0.07 or 0 0.08 is the legal limit in Arizona for driving, although with zero tolerance, that, that could change. 
So a person who weighs 100 and has three drinks, you can see that that's uh, about almost a little bit more than three times the blood alcohol content. So the way we're going to model this is we're, we really have two input variables here, W and D, and Y, your blood alcohol content, is going to depend on both of these guys. So what we're going to do is we're going to write this again as 0 0.032. That's our Y value is going to equal our beta naught plus our beta 1 times weight plus our beta 2 times the number of drinks. So for this beta naught, uh, for a person with 0 0.032, this is beta naught plus beta 1 times their weight, which is 100, plus beta 2 times the number of drinks, which is 1. And again, this vector is going to be very similar all the way down to the last value here. I'm not going to list them all out, but the last person has a BAC of 0.069. That will be the output of taking beta naught plus beta 1 times their weight, which is 140 pounds, plus beta 2 times the number of drinks they've consumed, which is three. And you can just see that these are all going to be the values. So our y vector, our actual y values, consist of the 0 0.032 all the way down to 0 0.069. And then once again, if we lift off the beta naught and beta one vector like so, and now we list out the coefficients, we'll have one, the person's weight, the number of drinks, all the way down to the last person, the, all the beta knots have coefficients of one. This person is 140 pounds, three drinks, and this will be our X matrix, and this will be our beta hat vector. So we're ready to go at it. We want to estimate the best fitting beta hats, and that's going to equal X transpose X inverse times X transpose Y. So let's go ahead and calculate that. And for our estimates here, we get the values about uh, around two decimal places. We'll get about 0 0.06, uh, 0 0.03, and negative 4.7. This might not be the best rounding to choose, but it'll do for now. So what we're saying is the person's BAC could be estimated by taking 0 0.06, adding that to the number of, or the beta 1, times the weight and taking and I, I think I mixed up my coefficients here in the calculator so uh, I corrected the coefficients here we should have a beta 2 here as well so in actuality this should be 0 0.06 minus 0 0.005 minus 0 0.005 uh, times the weight plus 0 0.03 times the number of drinks. So what I can conclude here is that for people, and, and remember this is for people who are have an age or have, have a weight between 100 pounds and 140 pounds. So I shouldn't use this to talk about people who are 200 or 300 pounds because that may not be the same, this may not be the best fitting model, but we have to keep in context what we're talking about here, and this is only for people between one and three drinks. So basically what we're saying, or what we're seeing here, is this summarizes all of our data, and we can say that a person for every, for every additional drink, the BAC increases by approximately 0 0.03. So, right, so if we make this from D equals 1 to D equals 2, that's going to double the number of 0 0.03s in there. And that's kind of what we see here. We see that the BAC is going up roughly by 0 0.03 for each additional drink. Same thing for a person of 120 pounds, and same thing for a person of 140 pounds on average. And then we could also say that for every one pound, additional pound of weight, uh, your BAC drops by 0 0.005. So for every, every additional pound of weight, BAC drops by 
about 0 0.0005. So basically, if you were to, if a person, two people were to consume the same number of drinks, and the only difference was they were a pound apart, we would expect their BACs to be different by 0 0.0005. So for every 100 pounds, for every additional 100 pounds of weight, uh, the same number of drinks will have about a 0 0.05 smaller effect on the, on, the, on the heavier person than on the lighter person. So if two people, a 100 pound person and a 200 pound person uh, were both to con consume the same number of drinks, we would expect their BAC to be different by about 0 0.05. And so we can continue to model this way. Really, it's just a matter of setting up these matrices and determining these coefficients. And we can gain some powerful results where there's a lot of data and a lot going on. These regression equations can just sort of help us understand what effect each variable in the equation has.